morning, everybody, and welcome to ITIF. This uh, event today is going to focus exclusively on the PCAST report and the kind of the rationale other than general interest in the PCAST report is the last spectrum event we did was to uh, release a report that we did at ITIF on spectrum policy. And the timing of that was such that it was about two days after the PCAS report was released, and everybody wanted to talk about the PCAS report instead of ours. So, uh, you know, the deal was I'll give you a chance to talk about PCAS if we can just talk about my report today. So they did. Uh, I'm hoping that we can answer uh, the list of seven questions that are on the announcement for the event on, on the website, that we can answer those seven questions here today. Namely, what the current system is for spectrum assignment, whether the current system is sustainable, how fast the government's appetite for spectrum is growing, how we can best manage the competing demands for spectrum between the commercial and government sectors, whether it's practical to replace uh, exclusive licensing and flexible use with a raw sharing um, scenario, what the alternatives are to purely exclusive versus purely unlicensed, and there's some interesting ones. And then what options, finally, the new technologies are going to give to policymakers to address uh, these issues about how spectrum is managed and assigned. So we have a very distinguished list of uh, panelists here today. Uh, Dean Brenner is the Vice President for Government Affairs at Qualcomm. Um, where he directs Qualcomm's initiatives relating to spectrum and telecom policy in North America and internationally. And he represents Qualcomm before the FCC and the uh, Canadian regulators and has a more distinguished background that you can read about on the, on the website. Michael Calabrese is the director of the Wireless Future Program at New America Foundation. And uh, Michael is... Uh, from my perspective, sort of the king of white spaces. And if you go to spectrum policy events in Silicon Valley, you're likely to see Michael there. And he, he's probably a better known presence in, in Silicon Valley than most other people are in, in Washington. And he's co-authored several books and, and articles. Uh, Michael Marcus, um, has a very distinguished educational background with the doctorate from MIT. He's worked at Bell Labs, the Air Force, the Institute for Defense Analysis. How do you like your Wi-Fi? You do, right? You should give Michael a round of applause because without him, you wouldn't have it. Because he's the guy at the FCC that did the policy work to make Wi-Fi a reality. And, and you know, if he didn't do anything else in the rest of his life, you know, he would be, uh, he'd be a hero. Um, Preston Marshall is the uh, Deputy Director of the Information Sciences Institute in the uh, USC Viterbi School of Engineering. Viterbi being one of the founders of Qualcomm, coincidentally. Um, and as a former program manager with DARPA. And what Michael is to white spaces, Preston is to dynamic spectrum assignment and cognitive radio. So he's, he's the guy on that. And he's also very well loved in Silicon Valley. And Peter Rasabi is the uh, founder and chairman and president of Rasabi Research. And he, has, uh, he consults with people that build actual networks, uh, has a very distinguished career in that. Uh, has worked for several leading companies doing test equipment and, and also network uh, deployment, and has written a very cogent report uh, criticizing the PCAS report. So I think it's pretty fair to say we've got a good mix of people on, on all six sides of the controversy. If, if it is a controversy. So what I'm going to do now is step back and allow each of the panelists to give a, a brief four to five minute overview 
of the aspects of the PCAST report that they think are most important, and hopefully we can start to separate the really good stuff from maybe the less good stuff and figure out where, where we go from here. Thank you, Richard. Um, so my name is Preston Marshall, University of Southern California. And uh, I'm going to answer some of the questions, at least address some of the questions that Richard asked, but not all of them. Um, and I'm going to focus really on the issues that have become contentious. There's a lot of aspects in the PCAST report that I think are equally important. Uh, introduction of receiver frameworks would have been really nice for Light Squared 20 years ago. Um, the introduction of a spectrum management team at the White House to balance the economic versus the technical issues um, above the level of the IRAC, I think, is a really important advance. But no, there hasn't been a lot of comments on those. I'm going to focus on the things where, where there's been a lot of comments. Um, Richard made a comment about PCAST reports replacing um, the current system of exclusive spectrum. I don't think that's really what it proposes. It proposes to augment it. So the PCAST report recognizes or believes that the clearing is becoming increasingly difficult, costly, and disruptive. Um, here, let's see. Yeah, um, essentially, in the congressional testimony, it's sort of thought as a snow plow. When you push against snow initially, it's pretty soft, but eventually you build up an ice, and it gets harder and harder. Bill Air from MIT, of course, shovel snow. Those of you in California, trust me, it gets hard. Because you, you build up and you compress it. And, and to some extent, that's what we believe has happened in federal spectrum. Um, there's certainly a lot of criticism one can make on the NTI report, and, and a lot of people have. But, but the perception was that in general, in, in its overall context, it, relocation is an increasingly difficult, expensive, and for the federal agencies, disruptive process. And so we need to find a new metaphor for managing spectrum. This isn't to say we walk away from individual band clearing where it's possible. But where it's not possible, we don't just leave that spectrum fallow. A lot of people have talked about the PCAST report as blue sky. It is far from that. Believe me, our believers in blue sky are all equally mad at the PCAST report because their pet technologies aren't in it, uh, at least in its initial baseline. We do spectrum sharing every day. At, at the congressional hearing um, last week, Steve Sharkey made a mention that they were sharing AWS-1 two years before people planned it because they were able to work with DOD and accomplish that. So spectrum sharing isn't new. The technologic basis of PCAST is in fact existing. We do it every day. What's new in PCAST is it says this shouldn't be one-on-one -on -one processes between an individual commercial user and a federal agency or a TIA, but it should be broadly based. It should be public. It should be transparent. We should go through the entire inventory of federal systems and find all of the shareable spectrum. Much like what the STA for uh, T-Mobile is doing, looking at 1755, let's do it across the spectrum. Let's make that spectrum visible to innovators. And ultimately, if that spectrum really has value and it becomes contended for, create a new kind of market for the right to share federal spectrum. That market reinforces the concepts of spectrum. It provides revenue to enable federal agencies to invest in being more shareable rather than just relocation. So there's really nothing in this report that we don't do today. What makes it different is a management framework around it, not the technical framework. There's been a lot of comments that industry won't invest in shared spectrum. If you look, at, we cannot go two weeks without announcements of some major carrier investing money in Wi-Fi infrastructure. There is no spectrum lousier than Wi-Fi. No, no insult to Mike Marcus. But it's congested, it's crowded, it's massively shared. We get incredible bits per hertz because we get massive spectrum reuse out of it. It's created great value. But we get incredible investment in that spectrum because it's available, it's short range. So clearly, spectrum that's shared has great value. The, um, the other aspect of PCAST report was that the people we want to share with in the commercial side are changing. We built out cellular. We're, built, we're in building cellular. We're looking for lower power systems. We're looking to get spectrum reuse. The attributes of those systems, which have high spectrum reuse, also make them more shareable. In the NTIA report, it looked at the 3.6 gig band and showed exclusion zones that basically precluded LTE services over most Americans. If you look at that same band with very, very low power, then you start to see that, in fact, that band's very usable for offload femtocells and such, even if it isn't usable for uh, macrocells. One other thing, the emphasis has been a lot on the dialogue between the cellular industry and the concepts in PCAST. But there's another player, and we don't know who he is yet. But someone's going to innovate some new ideas that are spectrum dependent. 
And if we don't have a way for them to enter the market, for them to discover the market base, to develop the technology, to mature their innovations, then cellular is the last innovation we ever deploy in the spectrum. And that would be a tragedy for America because someone else will deploy something. The, um, as I mentioned, the PCAST report is not dependent on any new technology. It's very conservative. It provides an opportunity for new technologies to come in. For example, my pet is dynamic spectrum access. PCAST says it, that makes a lot of sense if you can bring it in and prove to the agencies that it protects their equities, but it's not the initial position. We use uh, the very conservative TV white space to prove it protects federal equities. And lastly, there's been a dialogue like, why are we shifting? Why are we taking away spectrum rights? There's clearly a community out there that would like to revisit what spectrum rights mean, but that isn't the PCAST report. The PCAST report talks about developing a new framework doesn't subtract from the current framework. If you can clear a band and auction it and, it and it makes economic sense, go do so. But for the bands that aren't clearable, where it doesn't make economic sense, where you can't create enough national coverage in any one frequency, it opens up a new paradigm to make use of that spectrum for innovation. Thank you very much for inviting me, Richard. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Let me give a plug to my own event. Uh, on October 3rd, the Federal Communications Bar Association will have a brown bag lunch on, guess what, the PCAST report. It will be different than this event because I have decreed as chairman that it will not focus solely on the reallocation versus sharing issue. Hard as it is to believe, and you wouldn't could tell from reading trade press, there are other things in the PCAST report. There really are. Uh, and one of the speakers we're going to have at that event is Larry Irving, the former NTI administrator. who. Presumably, we'll talk about the impact of the report on federal spectrum management as a whole. Okay, there are other things in the PCAST report. Um, let me let me say that say that what I think of the most important section of the PCAST report uh, is a sentence on page uh, Roman numeral six that I, that uh, press sort of quoted. PCAST finds the clearing reallocation of federal spectrum is not a sustainable basis for spectrum policy due to high cost lengthy time to implement and disruptions the federal mission. I'm curious if any of the other speakers disagree with that. It would be nice if we could clear federal spectrum. It would be nice if we could reallocate it to private users. It would be nice. But in the current arrangement of spectrum management, which goes back to the 1978 creation of NTIA, we presently know it, the people who control federal spectrum management just do not have the incentives for the overall national good. This is not to denigrate Larry Strickland. Larry Strickland is doing a fantastic job given the, the organization that he has, but basically his charter is not adequate up to the job. Larry is an assistant secretary of commerce. He cannot call up the secretary of transportation, the attorney general, and say, those radio systems you know that, you, that your mission depends upon, that you pay with your own money, change the way they're built. That's not the way it, it's done, okay? Tom Whitehead of Blessed Memory, who it's, it pains me to say Richard Nixon did something right, but Richard Nixon hired Tom Whitehead, gave him authority, which is very, very different than the authority Larry Strickland has today. And Section 5 of the PCAST report, for the first time, starts moving in that direction. Now, I will have to say that Bush 43 started that. Does anyone here know the initials PPSG? Perhaps one of the most secret organizations in the federal government. <laughs> Richard, uh, the, uh, Bush 43 tried to create a political appointee committee to mediate between NTIA and the agencies. There's virtually nothing in the open literature about what PPSG actually does, and my inside sources tell me that while it was supposed to be political appointees, career civil servants often participate because their bosses are too busy to come. Uh, the current system is not working. Whether you want reallocations, whether you want increased sharing, nothing is going to change without fundamental change in the management of federal spectrum. And Section 5 of the report does a brilliant job in making modest changes in that direction. I personally would prefer to go back to something close to the uh, Nixon OTP, which, by the way, Nino Scalia was general counsel of, of that. So if you're a right-wing Republican, since Scalia worked there, it had to have been a good place. Uh, I did I did a cost uh, Justice Scalia at a Christmas party about this a year or so ago. He loved to talk to me because he was afraid everyone was to ask about the health care decision. He loved to talk about what he did in Nixon White House because he could talk about that. 
and we had a very nice discussion about that. That's the key thing. Section 3.2 talks about receiver standards. We're having a big argument now about seven, the 1755 megahertz band. Let me point out, if we had had the receiver standard framework that's discussed in section 3.2, the M to Z AWS 3 issue would have been resolved within a year or two. Okay. Now, whether M to Z would have gotten the spectrum, let me point out at the same time Sprint was willing to use that, spe that spectrum. The rest of the cellular industry hated it. T-Mobile, particularly having made some stupid decisions on radio receivers, uh, had an interference threat, but had Section 3.2 been implemented when the M to Z AWS 3 decision came out, then perhaps Sprint would not, uh, T-Mobile would not have made that stupid decision, and the 2155, 2175 band would be in use today, providing some sort of broadband service to some licensee. Maybe it wouldn't have been M to Z, but it would have been somebody. The, the co reason for the 1755 controversy is the loose ends hanging because 2155, its upper cousin, was never used because of the 3.2, uh, because of the receiver standard issue. Similarly, the light squared issue would have been resolved at some point. And the big issue here that people don't want to talk about is communication technology is rapidly, rapidly evolving. Qualcomm benefited in 1987 in a major decision that allowed it to sell its product two years after its incorporation. Qualcomm was incorporated in the summer of 85. In 87, it got the major decision that FCC would allow CDMA and any other 2G technology. Two years from incorporation to full regulatory go-ahead. That type of timing is impossible today. And unless we do something to, to improve both federal and non-federal spectrum management, we are sending signals to the capital, capital communities of this country, do not invest in wireless technology. And the cellular industry will not get the benefits of growth if people can't do the innovation to create new Qualcomms or for companies like Qualcomm or Motorola to invest money in innovative technologies because they can't get the regulatory go-ahead on a timely basis. Doesn't have to be yes, but it ought to be timely. Um, finally, the cellular industry likes to say that the sharing mechanism proposed in the PCAS report is a pipe dream. This is an academic, he works for a university, he's got to be an academic, right? I'm about as academic as you are. Uh, okay. I mean, I, I teach at Virginia Tech part time, so someone called me an academic too. Let me make an analogy. The cellular industry is very much enamored of FirstNet, the public safety scheme. FirstNet is the solution to all the public safety problems in the world. My view is that FirstNet and the sharing that's proposed in the PCAST report are not that much different. There is no commercial voice over LTE available in the USA today. FirstNet includes priority, preemption, spillover to commercial networks. All these things are doable. All these things are complicated, but they're doable. But interesting, the cellular industry embraces that without question. And yet the poor ideas press had, I was not involved in drafting the report. These are considered blue sky, infeasible things. We owe our public safety people a reliable, <coughs> minimal risk system. FirstNet is sort of going in the right direction, but it amazes me that the sharing ideas are vilified as being uh, <coughs> impossible or blue sky, and yet FirstNet is a straightforward, rational implementation, and I don't see the contract why it's so different uh, between those things. So I think I'll stop it. Oh, one, one minor point. Uh, Vannevar Bush, former president of my alma mater, uh, said at the end, wrote a report at the end of World War II called Science, the Endless Frontier, which set up the current, which led to the current National Science Foundation. In the 30 odd years I've been in the spectrum policy business, I came to FCC when the initial cellular rules were being seriously considered. Telecommunications technology is also an endless frontier. And one of the things which concerns me, but apparently nobody else is, if we do large reallocation to the cellular industry, what are we going to do 5 or 10, 15 years from now when some new metaphor comes up? Uh, during my career in spectrum policy, things have come up out of the blue 
And Spectrum Policy bears virtually no relationship to what it was in 1979 when I first entered the halls of FCC. And maybe we should do reallocations, but if we do reallocations, there has to be a scheme that we don't end up with one industry having a huge amount of spectrum that we can't retreat from as new concepts that we don't even know about today will become high priorities. It might be public safety concepts, it might be other things, but the spectrum management, like the endless frontier of science, is constantly evolving into new directions, and I don't want to put one set of firms as the gatekeepers for a large hunk of the spectrum. Thank you. Uh, uh, let me just say a couple of things that I should have mentioned up front. The hashtag for this event is uh, PCAST. And I'll, the other thing is that Metro PCS, Michael, now has voice over LTE. Yeah. Which advances the uh, just that forward one button? Just forward. Yep. Good morning. Uh, Michael Calabrese, uh, New America Foundation, and <clears throat> I will uh, talk, you know, I, I think somewhat, uh, to try to put the, the challenge that the PCAST uh, faced in a, you know, this, in a somewhat broader context of sharing and focus on the, um, on, on those parts of the report, which I, uh, which I worked on, and I have more slides than time, so I will whip through, and you can always uh, access this um, on the web if you'd like. So, start the um, I, I think what what the PCAS was really uh, uh, addressing was what I call the the great disconnect in telecom policy and that is scarcity amidst abundance so we've all heard a lot you know starting with the national broadband plan about the looming spectrum crisis. So a year ago, the FCC, the report about uh, mobile data demand will grow 20 to 50 times within five years. And in fact, it's, it, it has been on that pace that there'll be a spectrum deficit likely to approach 300 megahertz by 2014. Um, and yet, uh, uh, actual spectrum measurement studies um, when, you know, in other words, when you actually go out, in fact, a few weeks ago, I was at Illinois Institute of Technology. Dennis Roberson, the former CTO of Motorola, has run a spectrum observatory from a roof, a high roof overlooking downtown Chicago. And, and you know, and what he and others have found is that less than 20% of the beachfront spectrum is actually in use, even in the most congested cities, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, Chicago. So the challenge is that seamless, high-capacity mobile connectivity at affordable prices is going to require an enormous increase in overall capacity. But that doesn't necessarily mean it needs to come from, you know, today's uh, current business model entirely. Uh, so, let me see if I can... Ah, there we go. The great disconnect. So the conventional wisdom spectrum is scarce. Uh, the reality, of course, is that spectrum licenses are scarce. Um, exclusive use spectrum that fits the business model of, uh, of the carriers today. The reality, as I was saying, the spectrum measurement studies um, show that most is not in use. So there's a number of strategies to meet this mobile data demand. 
And I won't go into, obviously, more throwing more spectrum at the problem is one. Uh, I won't go into detail on this, but, and I know Peter has written a lot about this too, but we're really running into limits uh, in terms of um, really stretching things out using the current, the current model. And you may have heard of Cooper's Law, Marty Cooper, who uh, co-invented the cell phone, who you know, said that 95% of the increase in spectrum capacity has come from spectrum reuse. And of course, the carriers are bending to that logic increasingly. Uh, so they were very critical of, of unlicensed spectrum just a few years ago. Now AT&T, because they went first with the iPhone, acquired Wayport, the hotspot uh, network, which they've expanded to more than 30,000 hotspots. Uh, most iPad consumers, 90%, uh, don't even use a subscription because Wi-Fi is good enough for that. And particularly in Asia, um, they're, they're going far beyond what AT&T is in terms of uh, using shared spectrum for offload. Uh, these hat nets like Ruckus uh, has sold already reportedly over 100,000 hotspots just to KDDI. Tokyo is being blanketed with this uh, to provide, you know, the, the, it's pretty soon the vast majority of the actual uh, connectivity. That's the Ruckus slide. Um, so really the general approach that I've been advocating for quite a while is, um, is that licenses are for exclusive use, not non-use. And that goes, you know, I think doubly so for federal spectrum, which is not only greatly underutilized, uh, but also already is, you know, is, is being used by public agencies. So the PCAST, um, the, the basic thrust was to identify and open the most underutilized and useful bands for opportunistic sharing on a secondary basis, but subject to band-by-band -band conditions protecting incumbent users. Uh, the PCAS study, as I said, focused on federal spectrum. Uh, clearing and, re and Preston, I think, covered this pretty well, that, that clearing and reallocation for exclusive commercial use is simply um, not sustainable, or at least not fast enough. Few bands can be cleared anytime soon, um, wh whereas there's, there's more than 1,700 megahertz um, of spectrum below 3.7 3 gigahertz that is radar, radio air navigation, radio air telemetry, um, bands that have lower in intermittent use but no commercial substitutes. So it's unlikely that, much of, that most of that will be cleared for auction, yet there is tremendous cap capacity to be shared. Um, there's also the domino effect that we're seeing right now in the 1755 band controversy, which is where do you move the federal spectrum, spectrum system? So there's 19 agencies using the 1755 band to 1850. Um, you can you can move them, but then where do you move them when all the spectrum is assigned to someone? So the overarching recommendation of the, of the PCAST uh, was to state that the policy of the U.S. government is to share underutilized federal spectrum, not just go band by band for clearing. We can do that, but this is in addition, a supplement. So it called to identify immediately 1,000 megahertz of federal spectrum uh, for sharing and create the first shared use spectrum superhighway. Uh, this would make sharing by federal agencies the norm rather than you know, a disruptive exception. And, and, the, and the framework for this is, is three tiers of access to federal bands. The primary, primary access, which would be the federal incumbent system. Secondary access, which could be, it could be exclusively licensed. Uh, but again, secondary to the to the primary federal operation, um, okay, and and tertiary, which would be general authorized access, which is uh, essentially unlicensed. Uh, a spectrum access system uh, would enforce band by band rules at a road uh, for sharing uh, these these underutilized band. There'd be an emphasis on on small cell low power spectrum reuse, which is what we've enjoyed. Uh, today with Wi-Fi, and so the potential impact could be thousand, a thousand times greater. And let me wrap up just by, this is the three-tier hierarchy. Um, 
Already we know on the right side you see bands that the NTIA has already identified, including 950 uh, contiguous uh, that, that they're identifying as potentially for sharing. Um, and finally, the short-term recommendation is the 3550 to 3650 band, which is primarily naval uh, shipborne radar uh, for the Navy, which we can simply extend the TV white space geolocation database and require um, opportunistic access devices to register and to be frequency agile so that because the military's big um, biggest objection now seems to be that like the garage door opener situation uh, that if they cause interference they're afraid that once commercial devices get on these bands if they create an, any interference to the uh, to these devices that people will run to Congress and complain and they'll somehow get shoved out uh, but that doesn't necessarily need to be the case if we do things you know using uh, a little bit more intelligent systems so I'll stop there and uh, Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, how do I get my slides up? Great. Hi. Good morning. Pleasure to be here. So I have been involved in uh, wireless technology since uh, the early 1980s, uh, sorry, early 90s. And um, just to be clear, I'm not against spectrum sharing. I'm actually very enthusiastic about it. Um, but I think we have to be very cognizant of the time frames involved. It reminds me, uh, one of the first projects that I got extremely excited about was in the 1980s and it was touchscreen technology. And we as a development team knew that touch was gonna to revolutionize how people interacted with computers. And we were correct, we were just off by 25 years. Uh, it took Apple um, with the iPhone to show that you can do touch, but you have to do it in conjunction with other things such as slide and pinch to zoom and all kinds of other things that had to be brought together to make it work. And I see spectrum sharing the same way, which is that it does have huge promise, but the time frames and the complexities are much greater than we realize at this time. I'm trying to advance the slides. All right. So briefly, um, so these are some of the issues and considerations I see, and each of these points can be elaborated uh, on significantly, and I did uh, cover most of these items in the paper that I published, which actually preceded uh, the PCAST report. First of all, there's a huge amount of confusion about sharing approaches. There are many forms of sharing. You can share geographically, that is simple. You can do dynamic spectrum access, that is very complicated. So we have to be very clear um, what we mean by sharing. Um, the process of making sharing works involves negotiation stipulation of access rights, meaning if there's a primary user and a secondary user, how do they need to access a spectrum? Um, they're very complex technical issues and making things like cognitive radio um, work. Um, we're going to, if we get to dynamic spectrum access, need coordination systems where primary systems advertise how spectrum is available, secondary systems have to integrate with that. Um, and then try and make use of the spectrum. Once we even have all this, then you need certification of these systems. You need enforcement. What if somebody doesn't follow the rules? Um, and then once you have all this in place, suddenly you've placed constraints on how the technologies can evolve because they're now interlinked between um, primary and secondary. And then something I've been researching recently are the security issues, which I think are very significant. Previously, you had devices that ran in non-government spectrum. Suddenly, you have millions of devices, potentially, that can operate in government spectrum. What if those devices are compromised somehow? There are also these systems now are being coordinated centrally through databases and other coordination systems. What if those are compromised? Uh, so what you end up with, potentially, are um, networks that are just as expensive to build as they are today, 
Um, but their access to the spectrum is diminished. So from an operator perspective, you end up with kind of this mismatch between capacity um, and investment. Whoops, that was the wrong slide. So here's an architecture diagram. It's in my paper, um, and it just shows primary secondary systems having to integrate with spectrum coordination systems. Um, and then spectrum market systems as well, because if you're going to lease spectrum, rent spectrums, you also have to uh, develop mechanisms for that. So that represents the complex um, framework that we're moving to. There's nothing about this that can't be done. It's just a long-term process. If you look at 2G to 3G to 4G evolution, each of those cycles was a 10-year cycle, right? We don't just invent new things and then deploy them immediately. It's a long-term process. So looking forward, um, I don't see any actual sharing technology that could be deployed today. This is going to be a multifaceted process. Um, and in my view, to solve immediate concerns, um, we should still work on spectrum clearing and reallocation. And then work on sharing as a longer term process. Um, even though there are debates about whether the uh, spectrum crisis is looming, um, is in front of us, um, how far away is it, anybody that has tried to access a web page on their smartphone and has waited more than 10 seconds for that page to load, has that happened to anybody? <laughs> that is network congestion, congestion happening today. Right, this is a real problem. So I have additional papers on my website, and I think I've run out of time. Thanks, Richard. Hi, I'm Dean Brenner from Qualcomm, so I'll uh, run the Bell app here. Um, and it is ironic to be talking, having this discussion today with uh, people lined up uh, in front of uh, Apple stores all over the country for, uh, for the new iPhone 5. Um, so I agree with your point there, Peter. So let me, uh, and I, ha I don't have slides, but I did write a blog post on the PCAST report, which is on our HonQ Qualcomm blog. Um, and so some of what I say here is going to be uh, redundant with my blog post. But So let me just give a quick holistic vision about how we're looking at the challenge of the in incredible uptake in wireless data, mobile data usage at Qualcomm, and then I'll circle back to the PCAST report, because I do think that, like all great Washington debates, um, th uh, this one, if, it, if we can even call it that, has been just really polarized. And I think you could almost feel in the room in this panel the fact that there's a lot more agreement, actually, than disagreement. There are definitely topics, particularities, that we disagree on. But I think, actually, as I heard Preston's oral recitation, and some of, the, of Michael's oral points, there's a lot more agreement than disagreement. So if anyone came today looking for panelists to throw shoes at each other, you're going to be disappointed. So back to the, the big picture at Qualcomm, we see the challenge for the next 10 years um, that we've laid out is that we think wireless uh, data usage is going to increase by about 1,000 times uh, over 10 years. And that's a doubling every year for the next 10 years. And actually, Initially, when we set a goal, we actually set the bar a little bit lower than that, and we talked to some operators in Asia, and they said to us, you know what, Qualcomm, you're not thinking big enough. We're actually seeing more uh, usage than even you're projecting. So how in the world are we going to meet the challenge of uh, increasing capacity by a 1,000 times? Well, uh, some of the things that, that have been touched on are, are things that you know Qualcomm and our partners and others in the industry and and folks in garages are working on. I mean, their small cells are a crucial part of that. A new network topology with much denser uh, uh, network layout with uh, bringing the base stations much, much closer to the users is going to be crucial. So you get the spectral reuse, uh, supplemental downlink, carrier aggregation. There's a whole range of new technologies. And by the way, those technologies don't get brought to market by accident or by, uh, without massive expenditures of R&D money, and that's going to have to be uh, undertaken. And they don't get deployed without massive capex. These things don't just pop up overnight, and that's going to have to take place. Then, you know, the spectrum part of the equation is, you know, undeniable. We need more spectrum. The PCAST report doesn't disagree with that. So where, where does the spectrum come from? Well, there, I call three legs to the stool. There's 
license spectrum. Uh, that's the traditional approach, clear it and auction it. And um, I don't think that we should give up on that. And, you know, Chairman Janikowski read the PCAST report and doesn't say that, you know, we, it, it calls for us to give up on that. That obviously, you know, in, entails um, ensuring that the spectrum can be cleared in a, quote, reasonable time frame and by a date certain. And people can disagree about, the, the, you know, whether that is accomplished in a given band, how much it's going to cost how long it's going to take, all the projections about how much it's going to cost and how long it's going to take typically have been wrong, uh, like most projections. And so I think it all has to be read with a grain of salt. But, you know, no one says let's just give up on that approach. And then on the other extreme, you know, we need more unlicensed spectrum as well. Uh, Qualcomm, we make chips for Wi-Fi. Our new uh, 802.11ac technology is integrated into our top-of-the-line MSM 8960 chipset, Wi-Fi offload is important, but what kind of spectrum do we need for unlicensed? What we need is very wide spectrum because 802.11ac, which really is super Wi-Fi, it's here today, um, require, can use up to 160 megahertz wide channels. So therefore, the 5 gigahertz spectrum that's uh, targeted in the payroll tax cut legislation, 195 megahertz, immediately adjacent to the existing unlicensed 5 gigahertz band is ideal. Uh, for the next next generation unlicensed technology, 802.11ad, it operates at the 60 gigahertz band. It uses 2 gigahertz wide channels, and so 60 gigahertz is perfect for that. So now, what do we do in between? And that's really where, where we're talk, what we're talking about today. And in, by in between, I mean there is spectrum that could be made available, not on a 24-7 basis, not on a coast-to-coast -coast basis, but subject to protecting the rights of the incumbents in, you know, subject to their usage. There are these interstitial play times, geographies, and frequencies that could be made available. You know, that is great. We shouldn't just throw up our hands if a particular band can't be made available 24-7 coast to coast. Qualcomm uh, and our partners are working on a, a spectrum sharing paradigm. We call it ASA, Authorized Shared Access, it's called out in the PCAS report. That's great. It's being standard. Or accidental. Well, well, yeah, it's being it's being um, standardized in Etsy. Um, it's being worked on in SEP for the 2.3 gigahertz band in Europe. It would be great for the 3.5 band here in the United States. That's great. That's not a solution in isolation from the other solutions I talked about. And as Peter says, sad to say. It's not ready for deployment today. It's going to be built right into to LTE. Now, it is different in the sense that it's actually consistent with what Michael said. We want to create exclusive rights subject to the limitations that the primary user has rights that have to be honored, but to offer the predictable quality of service that you can't get from Wi-Fi, but that people you know, who expect the web page to load immediately depend upon, it does require an, ex an, an exclusive right, and it's going to be a new kind of exclusive right to be sure, but we can do this, but again, it's not, it's just one part of an overall solution, and it's going to take time, money, and commitment to, to get done. So, um, I, you know, where I disagree with the PCAST report, I don't think that the sharing by and you know, is the sole means that should be pursued. But, but Preston didn't say that today. I don't think that unlicensed should go immediately into 3550 to 3650. I think that, again, that, you know, I think we should have a proceeding about what the right way to, to, to proceed there is. And I think that's the way the FCC um, will approach it. And we don't have a technology that allows this three-layer cake that the PCAST report talks about, where you have a primary user, where you have an exclusive right for the, uh, we call the ASA rights holder, and then unlicensed on top of that, because again, for the exclusive rights holder, they need a predictable quality of service. So I disagree with the, you know, that's a, that, that vision is not one that we have a technology to support today. Uh, it would be great if we did. Um, and, uh, you know, completely agree with the comments about, you know, we need to make sure that new technologies can be brought to market as quickly as possible. So uh, I'll stop there. It was daunting to have the, that's got a time clock on it, so it was a little daunting there.
<laughs> yeah, I, I will note that the, the sharing people were worse on time. Than the <laughs> <laughs> so I, I found it very intimidating. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you can draw any conclusions from that. So. And by the way, Mike, we did get media flow approved by the FCC in 18 months from when we filed the petition. So I, I think it's still possible if you have a good idea to bring it to the FCC, even in a contentious proceeding. and people over there who are, you know, in good faith, work hard on it, and, you know, if things line up right, I think it can, it can still be done. how contentious it is. Yeah, absolutely. It depends what how contentious it is, what the but issues are. The right. white space with its 10 plus years of deliberation. Uh, I, I really think FCC is sending a message to investors in wireless technology, go away. Because it's not that FCC should approve everything that investors think of. You know, Section 7 is actually in the Communications Act. You know, maybe it's redacted for every copy of the FCC. Section 7 is there. Things should be approved or in a schedule. If the FCC can deal with corporate mergers, NBC, Comcast, AT&T, T-Mobile, consistently in a year, it should be able to deal with these new technology questions. Maybe not in a year, but in the two years that it gave Qualcomm to get going. I do not begrudge Qualcomm their two-year approval. <laughs> Thanks. The U.S. has had great economic growth as a result of that, but FCC consistently has not been able to reach, meet any schedule for dealing with new technologies that, that have been controversial. And that's, that's going to have a huge impact on the whole communications community. Well, that, that, this segues into on one of the questions that I, I didn't get an answer to. The, uh, the question of whether the current system for uh, managing spectrum is sustainable. And the current system, the way I understand it, you can sort of net it out into three words. It's upgrade and repack. So with digital TV, you know, what we did was we had an analog TV system that, that had a spectrum footprint that was about 800 megahertz. It was converted to digital, reduced the spectrum footprint, you know, went in half, but it, it's even, it was even better than that because now the TV broadcasters can send out uh, up to five programs at once. So it was actually an order of magnitude improvement in the uh, efficiency of use of, of the television spectrum. Now, a, and a transition of that, mag and this is simply the application of technology. We took a traditional application that was as close to a holy cow as you can get, I believe. I mean, you look at the installed base for analog television. I mean, this is this transition affected every household, virtually every household in America. And and we were able to pull it off. And and because of, we were able to pull it off, we got white spaces for Mike. We got uh, 700 megahertz for the carriers, big and small. And and we also got a, a you know a higher quality over the air television system. Uh, with high definition TV and everything. So Moore's Law is the thing that, that's behind this. So if you believe that the current system is not sustainable, what you're saying is that you don't think Moore's Law is going to continue to operate. I mean, how can you possibly believe that? So, so I think that's, <laughs> that's addressed at both of us. So let's think about sustainability. Yeah, okay. So. The model of, of replacing analog with digital TV was was noticed as a singular article. The analog system with the digital TV system. Part of the reason that the PCAST report argued unsustainability was that we're not talking about the federal system. We're talking about aircraft telemetry. We're talking about ground-based radars. There's no one place to go and do that transition. And I suspect that transition wouldn't have been so simple if people didn't have the opportunity to go buy LCDs really cheap. It's kind of a confluence of the economics there. But in looking at the federal users, there are two things that are present. Is that in the federal users, they have appetites for new systems. So even replicating, they were already planning on using the, the digital benefit, if you will, going from analog to digital, because their information rates are growing at the same thousand that, uh, that Dean talked about. And two, th there's no one-stop shopping in the federal system. So. Technologically, I think the metaphor makes some sense. Pragmatically, we, we felt that the, arg the basic argument that we are dealing with such a heterogeneous population 
that you're just not going to go in and do these nice clean transitions. So it's not a technology issue. I mean, you believe in Moore's law, right? I well, mean, Moore's so law doesn't. Okay, first of all, there is no Moore's law for radars. There is the radar equation, and and, and we tended to squeeze. We do this dialogue because we think comms on comms. But, and as you look at how the federal spectrum has been squeezed, it's increasingly we're looking to do comms on radars. Comms on radars or moving radars is a, is a technology that's just not there yet. A massively better radar technology is not present. So we, we basically, without concurring with individual items in the NTA report, and it's certainly not my job to defend it, the gestalt of that report, that we have these systems and there's no equivalent technology available commercially, I think the PCAS report bought into. Individual systems, yes, you can move. The uh, current, yeah, yeah, my head hurts. This one. Can I, oh, okay. you know, if you want to talk about DTV, first thing I suggest, forget all the folklore that comes from NAB. Joel Brinkley, David Brinkley's son, former New York Times reporter, wrote a book called Defining Vision. NAB hates it, okay? I think what's in Defining Vision is the story of how DTV came, around, came along. Key thing is the broadcasters were interested in not H, not DTV. We're interested in high definition TV. The broadcasters have their back to the wall in the early 80s by Motorola, who was trying to grab more spectrum for hard as it is to believe now, uh, analog private land mobile. That was the you know David Joel Brinkley describes it very very well there. We got that the broadcasters got this as a counter revolution going and lost control of it, and that's how it happened. Let me point out, in the early 90s, we started a transition for narrow banding part 90. That was started in the early 90s. It's not finished yet. And it was supposed to be finished last year, I think. It's still not finished. As I, when that was approved, I told people that the people who implemented at FCC were still in high school. You know, the, the problem is a regulatory problem. The, regular, the technology moves at internet speed. The people, wizards at Qualcomm come up with these wonderful gadgets. The regulatory system, both on the FCC side and the NTIA side, cannot keep up with technology because its time constraints are too long. But what did I say a few minutes ago? New technologies ought to be resolved in two years. Does that seem unreasonable, the speed at which new technology moves forth? And yet the FCC, while it can deal with corporate mergers in two years, could not deal with the M to Z technical issues in two years. They left poor light squared there dragging the wind for 10 years and then did a flip-flop. Nobody's gonna invest in communication technology if regulatory approvals become so dilatory and so unpredictable that both on the government side and the FCC side, we need to get timeliness and regulatory certainty for either reallocation or for sharing. The problem at the moment, it would be nice to have reallocation. The problem at the moment, it is as unpredictable as a lot of these other things that FCC and NTA involved, are involved in, and the regulatory systems have not kept up to the time and have not kept up to the time scale of internet speed as opposed to the time Sorry, scale. It's not so much, in your point of view, it's not so much a technology issue as a regulatory issue. The regulatory think. system has to be more responsive than it is today. And it's nice to go tell CTA, we loved you, we're going to do everything you ask. Mm -hmm. But the problem is neither on the FCC side nor the NTA side can they deliver. And, and, and there are some structural problems of trying to, trying to make in the NTA side a 1978 structure in the FCC side, in, you know, I like to say 1935 structure, what did the FCC do in its first meeting in 1935? First thing the FCC did in 1935 was divide the FCC, then seven commissioners, into three mini FCCs. So we, there was probably more decision-making throughput in the FCC <coughs> in 1935 than there is today because there were three well, parallel And the FCC FCCs. is not even in charge of federal spectrum users. But, but even I mean, within its side, if you look at the problem of M to Z or light squared, those were, well, light squared, yeah, yeah. it was an FCC, FCC couldn't resolve those things in time. Yet in 1935, there was no Administrative Procedures Act, and there were three mini FCCs, one for radio, one for telephone, one for telegraph. Okay. There was parallel processing in 1935 that no longer exists in the FCC today. Michael? Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so I believe the, you know, you're asking about sustainability. So, you know, solving this through reallocation for exclusive use, I think is unsustainable for both uh, regulatory and technological uh, reasons. On the regulatory side, I think you only need to look at the, you know, at the national broadband plan, what's happened. So there was this, pro you know, this promise of 500 megahertz more uh, below 3.7, roughly. And the FCC oh, itself... A goal, not goal more than a promise. A goal. Yeah. And the FCC could only identify, in theory, 200 and roughly 270 megahertz of non-federal spectrum that could potentially be reallocated for exclusive use. Mm -hmm. um, about 40 of that was already in the pipeline. 210, so about 75% of it was, was two sources, broadcasters and mobile satellite. Well, look what happened to Light Squared. We lost 40 there, roughly. Um, so a bunch of the mobile satellite spectrum is not coming online for flexible uh, broadband. And, and we'll get less than half of the 120 um, from broadcasters that they're talking about. Because in fact, we really failed um, to, uh, it just shows that you know, the political system can't seem to move this spectrum uh, out of incumbents' hands fast enough. I mean, there was definitely a strange bedfellows coalition. I mean, something else I've been advocating for 10 years is to get commercial broadcasting off the air entirely. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, as have, you know, many uh, conservatives and others, and, and, and we're at the current point where it's a, it's a voluntary bribe system, which is not likely to net, you know, more than about 60 more megahertz. On technology, I would just say that the, 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 the Moore's Law for radio is, is spectrum reuse. Um, the ITU, when the ITU did their study uh, projecting the need for more spectrum based on current business models, they came up with a need for 1,780 more megahertz of spectrum to sustain just three competing networks. Mm. And our policy is typically to have more than that. Uh, and they said they said in their report, and I think Peter knows this better than I do, you can correct me, that advanced LTE would, would be at 75% of, of Shannon's law, of the Shannon's law limit. So when you're looking at Shannon's law, which is how much data can you shove through the pipe over a certain frequency, there is no Moore's law there. The Moore's law is in spectrum reuse, mm. and there, Carriers over a recent two-year period could only increase their cell sites by 15%, while, da while data use was quadrupling. Um, and so the only way is to bring the infrastructure, is to bring, the, in a sense, the base stations into basically into every home and building, um, with, and, and to reuse the spectrum, very small cell, very low power, something that's much more um, compatible with a shared spectrum, a hybrid architecture, but exclusive plus shared. And, and, and so we're going to need to do that. There's different ways to do it. And I know Qualcomm, you know, has, has one way, which is more like a private commons way of managing sharing. And you can have opportunistic unlicensed, I believe, too. And some bands will be better for one versus the other. Uh, but there, there definitely uh, is a sustainability problem. We can't just throw spectrum at this problem. Well, I, I, have to, I have to push back on something you said, where that Moore's Law and wireless is only reused. Because Wi-Fi, the first Wi-Fi standard, you know, was one to two megahertz, a one to two megabits per second running on a 20 megahertz channel. And this is in 1996. So 15 years later, the same 20 megahertz channel for Wi-Fi could support speeds up to 108 megabits per second. But, 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 but there, there was a major regulatory change. The reason for the first one is, Wi-Fi has a complicated history. It was a way to get spread spectrum into the commercial spectrum, which helped enable what we now call CDMA. And the original Wi-Fi system was working a set of rules from 85 to the early 90s that required to be spread spectrum and threw in a factor of 10 in efficiency. So you're comparing, a diff you're comparing two different sets of rules in two, different, in two different technologies. The early Wi-Fi okay. was under the mm, 85. That, uh, that, fair enough. So when we went to, from frequency hopping to direct sequence spread spectrum, we went from two megabits up to, well, we went from two megabits to 11. But then, and that was 802.11b. 
So it's no longer frequency hopping. But so that was in the late 90s, and then we went up to 11G at 54 megabits per second. And an FCC rule change that enabled it. Between G, B, and G? G needed a rule change. G, when G went in, the spread spectrum requirement was dropped. But B doesn't use spread spectrum. B, well, direct for, sequence. The people who built B said it did. B, yeah. But B still has a 10 to 1 inefficiency because of its interpretation of the rules that were in effect at the time. Okay. But so between G and N, we went from 54 yeah. megabits yeah. to 108 without any rule changes. But G and N, but N is a dead end. The, the eigenmatrix separation you get with more than about four channels drops off. So MIMO is great, four times maybe, typically more like 2.5, but that one's over. It was good, it was great. You know, we, we, we plotted all the San Diego ones, eigenmatrix separation at about two gig, and it's around four. So we've used that one off. Um, and I think advanced LTE is something like 10 times so, increase, but, increase in efficiency, but the problem is given the same, if you assume the same cell size, and the same band, frequency band, you run into, and again, it's more of a Preston question because I'm not an engineer, but but as I understand it, you run into a Shannon's law limit, um, it, you know, unless you have reuse. We ought to well, let's see, but, but Shannon's law, one of the terms in Shannon's law is signal to noise ratio. And that's a very, that's a very flexible term, okay, because it, I mean, and this is one of the reasons that Qualcomm exists. Because, you know, Qualcomm, their, their founders did the engineering that it turns out there are several ways to represent information in a radio system such that it can be distinguished from noise. I mean, so, so noise is a constant, but there, are, there is constant work being done in coding theory to increase the efficiency and the resiliency and the robustness with which information can be transmitted over radio systems. So, but I think to some extent, the discussion about spectrum and Shannon is, is an irrelevant one. If, if you take Dean's number of a thousand times, increases against Shannon are at best linear. They're actually log. Um, increases in spectrum, if we got all 500 megahertz, it's only doubling spectrum. So if cellular industry got 500 megahertz and it got twice as much from Shannon, it has gotten eight out of a thousand times. The sustainable solution to the problem of wireless is to deal with the other 125 times. And so the emphasis should be in the 125, and the way to get to the 125 is by enabling massive spectrum reuse meaning more frequencies, lower power, actually lowering as to signal to noise, higher packing. And, and that's really the focus in the PCAST, was that you're going to make this shift, that putting more and more spectrum on the table creates linear increases against an exponential demand, and therefore look to technologies and look to opportunities to make use of the federal spectrum to help assist the cellular carriers, maybe in not building out their macro cell networks, but in building out the microcell and femtocell, the FCC 3.6 gig proceeding that's, I think, coming along that the chairman talked about is really the first example of that, where here spectrum is unsuited for macrocell, but very well suited geographically and temporally to be shared for microcell. And, and to look at this divergence in the architecture, one architecture for coverage, one architecture for capacity. So when we're trying to achieve a thousand times goal like, like Dean is, we can't really leave anything off the table, can we? No, exactly. I mean, he took the words out of my mouth. Right. Um, you know, completely agree with what Preston is saying that densification of the network to get greater spectral reuse needs, you know, is absolutely going to be crucial. Completely, we're completely excited about 3550 to 35, 3650 band as a dedicated small cell band, and we're very open to, uh, you know, the right approach to make that happen. Again, I don't want, I don't, the right approach isn't to just immediately put on license but, into but that band. Just one to clarify, the, the PCAST report presumed that if you bought exclusive, there was no one license there. So it really tried to create the market mechanism in the shared bands that you have an exclusive use. So, so yeah, you're concerned about you don't want unlicensed underneath you? Absolutely, that was the intent, okay. to give you QoS in a band and, right, and give you something that was an equivalent investment opportunity. Yeah. An example of that too, right, in that same band, this was the short-term PCAST recommendation, 3550 to 3650, right, is that you could have, for example, in, in that three-part hierarchy, so there's shipborne radar, the Navy has their radars, they're mostly off the coast. Um, secondary could be 
for example, um, license for indoor use. So, for example, you know, that's one of the big problems is how do you expand the, you know, not the macro cell network, but the sort of things that the carriers originally hoped to do with femtos and so on. How can you get, you know, more, more capacity, um, particularly indoors? You could have licensed indoors. You could have um, wherever it's needed or wanted. That can be represented in a database along with the Navy. And then you can have oper the, the third tier, unlicensed. You could have opportunistic unlicensed filling in everywhere else that people would like to get access where it's not interfering with the licensed secondary or the primary Navy. Yeah, although, Michael, our studies, and we actually have a little test deployment of this on our campus in San Diego show, that if you get a dense deployment of small cells indoors, you actually get pretty good coverage outdoors without putting a single oh, sure. if it's small compatible. cell indoors. If it's right. compatible. Whether that's right. good or bad. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, Michael, but, you mentioned QoS. Yeah. I just want to comment on that, which is that um, at least for operator networks, um, they manage their networks extremely tightly, and knowing exactly how much capacity they have um, is, is, is crucial. So if you want to provide a high level of quality of service, um, any sharing mechanism has to be very predictable. Um, so if, if, if the secondary entity knows how much spectrum they're going to have and when, um, then you can eventually make it work. You can, you can create the technology, but if it's unpredictable, if, if you're going to tell an yeah, operator that... What's unpredictable in the PCAS recommendations? There's no DSA. There's no unpredictability. Well, you can go to the database and find out what you can have, and you have it all, and you can buy it all. Right, but even the, even the PCAS, I've, looked, I've studied the architecture diagrams, it, and, and, and you're right. There's a database you can query, you can find out. All I'm saying is that if, if you have a regime where the primary user can have use of it anytime they want, and the secondary user doesn't know what to expect, um, then that becomes a very challenging. But you've got a time situation. to live. We give you, but in, in the PCAS recommendation, you know, not to go down the weeds, but suppose you've got the next six hours because we know that there's no Aegis cruiser within 100 cl clicks of Norfolk. You've got guaranteed for six hours. I mean, it did it did a lot of work, which I don't think the carrier community has really appreciated to try to meet the needs of predictability and QoS management heck of a lot better than the half of the traffic that's being dumped off on Wi-Fi does. Um, and so I, I think, you know, if you really dig in there, you'll see it tried to create essentially an equivalent certainty as a, in an existing exclusive license regime, although not geographically, not nationally, and not for all time, as, uh, as Dean mentioned. But within the period of time you get just a little micro license, you have total certainty. And, I, and we've well, really right, tried I to agree, I agree though, but is an operator going to invest billions of dollars in an infrastructure for a network where they may have it for six hours at a time. Now, I agree, it's completely predictable for that interval of time. But from a capacity management point of view, can you manage a network where you don't know on any day what your capacity is going to be? Okay. I, uh, I wrote a series of papers a couple years ago on what I call interruptible spectrum. Maybe my wife's in the power industry. Maybe I spent too much time at power industry cocktail parties. But the power industry and the gas industry sell both electricity and interruptible electricity. Gas and interruptible gas. And maybe one of the problems the telecom industry is that it wants to sell everybody high QoS. And if it could get all the spectrum it wanted 24 hours a day, it could do that. And Press is perfectly willing to give them all the spectrum they want to talk about. The reality of the current spectrum management mess in the U.S. is you're not going to get it. It's not because Press is a bad guy. It's not because the PCAS people hate CTIA. It's the fact that the current pragmatic system is you're not going to get it. Now, when, when light gives you lemons, you make lemonade. The utility industry, given fluctuating electricity supply, fluctuating electricity demands, tries to balance demand by a combination of giving people a guaranteed QoS and sells a somewhat different QoS, which they charge less for. Okay? For some reason, the communication industry has not gotten through its thick head that, that that's a way to balance supply and demand, even though in the gas and electricity business, it's a fundamental thing there. But the rea also the reality of federal spectrum use is, with the notable exception of San Diego, in space, federal spectrum use and non-federal spectrum use is orthogonal. 
they're in different places most of the time. San Diego is a nightmare for a lot of reasons. It's the only U.S. city with military base in downtown. It's near the Mexican border. San Diego is San Diego is, is, is Norfolk. Norfolk's not a major city, in all due respect. <laughs> <laughs> I spent time in Norfolk. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, everyone shows slides of spectrum occupancy. The real issue is when you look at federal spectrum use in space and time, and you look at non-federal spectrum use in space and time, they're sort of orthogonal. So you know with pretty high confidence, not absolute confidence, that they're not going to be in the same place at the same time. There's a possibility of that, but it's, it's, they're in different places at different times. And one tool the cellular industry could use is learn from the electric industry and the gas industry of offer people different QoSs, particularly with a little bit of experience, you find out that the low QoS is like, a, like for my air conditioner at home, uh, Pepco turns it off for a few 15 minute slots during the summer. It's you know, not the end of the world, but I have chosen to take a discount on my electricity in order to let Pepco turn it off maybe the cellular industry ought to start being a little bit more creative and you know it'd be nice if they could get all the spectrum we're not opposed to it well but, but it's I not going to happen but but we have that today and that we get we get billed a different way for voice and data on on smartphones i mean the, uh, so i think the cellular industry does has embraced that there's no quas for data it, and if you want to you know you want to try to do skype over your data plan you can do that and you save minutes if that's if but, that's an but issue. nobody offers to college students a plan that says you might have a little bit worse service for some oh, there, we're going to charge you less there there are some small carriers that are starting to experiment with business plans like that where they have networks that, that lease a very small amount of that act as mbnos to get some access to the cellular network, but they're counting on using Wi-Fi, you know, for most of the traffic. So to, to back up a little bit, let's, let's think about how cellular carriers actually share spectrum. Take take the example of Sprint. They have a network. They sell retail service to their customers. They also sell uh, service to uh, to uh, MVNOs like uh, Cricket and. Uh, uh, Virgin Mobile, which is now part of Sprint, was like that there. So that's a virtual network that operates over Sprint's infrastructure. Sprint has roaming agreements with other networks, so they, they actually take packets from some of these small CDMA networks and they may even offload some of their some of their traffic. So they're they're sharing it uh, I mean not only with all their retail customers, but they're sharing it, you know, several different ways. And the, the model for that, it seems to me that, I mean, this is something that there was a, a panel discussion on PCAST report in Silicon Valley a couple of weeks ago, and Greg Rostin, you know, made this point that flexible use is, in his mind, one of the great policy innovations in, in spectrum management. And so the, that's why the carriers have the ability to upgrade the technologies on their networks the way they have, and, and they have the ability to engage in MVNO business arrangements and in, and in roaming. Is, is the real nugget here the concept of the, the sort of middle tier of that pyramid where, where you have what essentially amounts to authorized shared access? Because I'm concerned with, you know, the purely unlicensed uh, approaches, I think there are tragedy of the commons effects that, that come into play whenever you have a critical resource that's available at no cost. You know, it will be abused, there, and regardless of what your observatories tell you, I can tell you from my product development experience in, in Wi-Fi systems, there's an awful lot of people that are experiencing critical congestion in Wi-Fi systems despite the fact that they have 350 megahertz available for their use. You know, those things are, are very real and when, and when a Wi-Fi scenario gets congested, we don't have any management tools we can apply to that because the management of Wi-Fi is basically non-existent. Well, good so is, is authorized shared access the sort of middle way, uh, the most effective way to share spectrum or is or is there something better than that so what uh, it, you know i guess and this is something we should have 
maybe clarified uh, more, but what the PCAST report calls ge you know, general authorized access, what I would call opportunistic uh, unlicensed, which would be a kind of a, you know, an, an, you know the fallback uh, position, you might say, when, when capacity is, is not being used. It's not like today's, it's, like, it's not like today's uh, garage door openers or baby monitors. They're not dumb devices. It's not even like Wi-Fi today that's uh, merely contention-based. The, the, what the PCAST report recommended was that as these federal bands, these shared federal bands are open in this three-tier hierarchy, that the general authorized access, the unlicensed access, would be subject to requirements, not only band-by-band band requirements to make sure, because the Navy might have different interference uh, protections needed than other places, uh, but, but a more general requirement that the devices mm -hmm. um, must be connected devices, so they have to be they have to be connected to the spectrum access system. They have to be in touch, and they need to be multi-band. They need to be able frequency agile. So, for example, you know, to answer this question, if let's say the um, th this 3550 to 3650 band or any other band, if we decide later that some exclusive exclusive licensing would great would get much better use out of out of some portion of that band, and that they couldn't tolerate the general authorized access, then the database simply turns that, that those frequencies off, uh, you know, simply denies permission. So one minute, one minute device, these uh, unlicensed devices will have, uh, say, six or eight or ten different frequencies to choose from, and, you know, the next minute is one less, because that's just removed from the, from the database. And that's exactly how the TV bands database works. The t for, for TV white spaces, uh, you walk into a market, a you know, next year a device goes into a market and it'll have permission to use, you know, 14 channels. And then a month later, it might only have permission to use 12 channels. And it goes to a different, to a market uh, 10 miles, you know, 50 miles away, and it has an entirely different set of channels to use. So, so the whole idea is if the device is con a connected device uh, that has to go to the database and get, and get, uh, get updates on its terms of access, get firmware upgrades, uh, get the permitted or denied to use, and it can switch frequencies so that the consumer isn't frustrated. And this is all automatic in the background. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so that's the way that you can basically um, de decide, you can decide five years later that you want um, exclusive secondary access to a particular band that was already populated with unlicensed devices. So, and that is all feasible. It's just going to take, take a, a while. Time. Yeah. But, it's, but it's going to take a while for the regulators. I mean, the technology to do TV white space is there. The ability to draw interference patterns, although we fight over it, you know, we engineers love to fight over it, is there. Um, the pieces to put this together are all there. The only thing that hasn't been done is to put them together. Um, and like all things that haven't been put together, the only solution is to just start that work. So I think the innovation in PCAST is to address that tragedy of the common. I know Bill's published a lot of papers about tragedy of commons. Whether it's true or not, it's a belief. And so by introducing this, this intermediate licensing, mm -hmm. we, we solve the problem of creating lots of flexibility and access for the devices and that, that Mike was particularly concerned about and still create the certainty on the side. So I think people saw PCAST as saying, oh, let's take all the spectrum and make it unlicensed. Actually, it's a very market-driven mechanism. And it basically says if there's no demand for spectrum, we, we put this out, we get 500 megahertz, all the devices are happy. Why would anyone spend money? You could deploy a cellular system and not spend a cent. As it becomes more congested, like Wi-Fi, you have the right to buy QoS and that spectrum in those areas you need it. If I'm an innovator and I build a product, I deploy it on license, people really like it, I start to buy licensed spectrum for it for the next five years. No, I mean, we I th break I the that, line between these two yeah. extreme models we have today. Yeah, the, the, <coughs> Now we, we, you know, again, as I said, I think we need all three legs of the stool. Completely agree about that, and I completely agree we shouldn't just throw up our hands if the band can't be clear 24/7 coast to coast. I also wanted to say, you know, the incentives part of the PCAS report. You know, the agencies have zero incentive, and you know, I completely agree with that. That there needs to be a, a set of incentives slash brute force to make this to get the spectrum freed up. There, there's no quarrel there. My, my quarrel would just be, you know, we don't need, uh, 
first of all, 100 megahertz for unlicensed isn't going to move the needle in a world where uh, AC require you know can use 160 for one channel. And second of all, I don't want to put unlicensed into a band, you know, based on Michael's belief that we can you know use a kill switch. Let's have a you know, and I don't think that's what the FCC is going to do. They're going to take a comprehensive look at 3550 to 3650. We're very excited about the prospect of that as a dedicated band for small cells, which again will be a crucial part of the, of, of, of the infrastructure. Um, the NTIA exclusion zones are based on WiMAX-based macro cells. Hopefully those exclusion zones can shrink to you know as much as possible based on a small cell deployment. And I know that the commission is thinking about different innovative licensing approaches, and that's all great. That's what you mentioned right there. Hopefully they will shrink. Who is the judge and jury of that? Yeah, uh, uh, right. Who? Who? It's NTIA as right. a judge and jury. Right. What are the incentives for NTIA to be the judge and jury of that? Which gets me back to Section 5. Thank you for talking about it, but yeah. nobody wants to talk about Section 5. Everybody wants to talk about how the cellular industry is so upset over we'll the possibility of sharing. Uh, you know, nothing is going to work until you reform spectrum management. Well, that's the, that's the side. big contingency is that, that the government agencies that are currently using it have to be okay with sharing it. And well, we, they have to, they have to be and, and, motivated. And that's my question. Yeah. It, it's obviously clear that even the enticement of you know, possibly getting billions of dollars of revenue from auctioning off exclusive licenses does not seem to be adequate, if I read the NTIA report correctly, uh, to uh, to induce or compensate federal agencies to possibly reduce their use or to uh, uh, to, to to move to a different uh, different band for the, the, the 17 1800 megahertz spec light uh, the band that they were talking about. What about what is going to change here that is going to cause them to induce? to be able to give up a thousand megahertz on a uh, basis. The problem is they're not economic actors. Because we don't ask them to give it up. So today, I mean, this, the fundamental difference is between spec they, why, spectrum why, use... Even if they don't have to give it up, they, why do they want to do a thing at all? They don't have to do anything. So today, let, let's look at the framework today. Today our framework is we have two things, allocations and assignments. For the commercial world, they're almost the same. But for the federal user, Allocations are like this, and assi actual assignments in any place on earth are like this. In the past, we went and said to agencies, you have to reduce your peak you might ever use anywhere in the United States in order to get any spectrum into the civil pool. Therefore, for DOD, who looks out, say, at Mojave Desert and sees massive test training, all that, they say, I need that peak. Do they need it in New York? Probably not but they have to protect it everywhere in the United States because that's the only way we manage allocations. In the PCAST framework, only, system, only spectrum you get to keep, essentially, is the spectrum you're using. So if the federal agency uses a lot out of Mojave, fine. I every time I'm out there, my cell phone never even works. No one even wants to light up one channel. Um, if they, if they want to use it out of Mojave, fine. If they can afford the equipment to fill it, great. But in New York City, that spectrum becomes available. We ask a different question. We ask, what are you lighting up right now and actually using, and rather than what is your peak demand? The yeah, problem is we're moving allocations today. I can't tell you I'm not going to be using, that I'm going to be using this much in this area, because I'll tell the bad guy that that's where no, I don't land. Most, most of the stuff is static. Stuff. I think in, in dealing in, in with the interaction with DOD, I think in the end there was a agreement that there could be adequate security provided of assignments to still open up enough information to make the sharing possible. So, um, and the PCAST report addresses the incentive issue even a little more. So what Preston described was the worst case, they do nothing. Um, you know, I think you know, we'll get a lot more capacity better if, if the agencies facilitate sharing. So there may, you know, there's upgrades in their technology, putting better Maybe better, you know. I know Mike wrote a paper, for example, saying and, and these some of these radar systems could be shielded better, and so on. And so, what the PCAST report suggested was they, they didn't go all the way to federal federal spectrum fees, um, uh, but what they said was let's introduce a form of spectrum, so-called spectrum currency, to start internalizing the opportunity cost and expand the spectrum relocation fund. 
that exists, right, back from the 2006 AWS auctions, um, expand that into a spectrum efficient, a revolving spectrum efficiency fund so that agencies are all eligible to apply for reimbursement for costs to facilitate sharing, including upfront costs for planning, R&D, and so on, um, and to upgrade their own systems as long as, the, as they can demonstrate that that has a, you know, a spectrum efficiency payoff. And so then when the commercial guys who buy QoS on the secondary access layer, um, that money ideally should be, should, or a portion of it, and, and some portion of future auctions of federal spectrum as well, should go into that fund. So that fund is revolving and then it will pay these costs. And now who knows if that's enough, a sufficient incentive, but at least, at least they're not out of pocket on their mission if we're asking them to upgrade their technology to not only make themselves more efficient, spectrum efficient, but to facilitate sharing with the commercial sector as well. Oh, one of the suggestions I've heard is that we should offer a coupon program so that federal agencies can get a spectrum converter box <laughs> that will enable them to use commercial spectrum for their mission and then free up every time. It's not necessarily a serious suggestion. But we, uh, we're out of time unless there's a, one more burning question from the audience then then I think we're I think we're done here and certainly people are free to come up and speak to, to the panelists and uh, thank everybody for coming out and <laughs>